With Bitcoin, we remove completely all the need for all the legal, all the regulatory, all the enforcement infrastructure that is super expensive and that is needed in order to, to reach consensus on who owns what. You realize that what people used to use, uh, where our ancestors used as self-custody wealth, they used this uh, as an insurance. And what Bitcoin enables is just that, in case uh, things go crazy, that it's very likely nowadays. If you think about it, internet is changing completely the trust in our institutions. How do you in general foresee Bitcoin scaling and evolving in like the next decade or two decades? Uh, because we have not a lot of bit, uh, b people in Bitcoin now, and I hope we have a lot of people in Bitcoin in like 20 years. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, Liquid is one option, but Liquid is just an implementation of, of the Elements code base. So uh, even if Liquid were not able to scale it all, and even if by adding uh, Lightning Network on top of Liquid, it were not enough, uh, then we ha anyone can spin up an another federation for a particular number of use cases, for example. And, and others could uh, implement their own uh, sidechains for Bitcoin, right? And... And depending on the trade-offs, uh, there might be use cases for which a number of uh, trade-offs trade on the chain would be preferable to those on Liquid. I don't know. But if that were the case, others have the elements code base uh, right there, you know, available to spin up uh, anything and, um, you know, and uh, cater to the right use cases. So... I think I think uh, we'll see that happening. I don't. Uh, I probably not one of the people that thinks uh, that um, uh, everyone is necessarily going to be using uh, Bitcoin for absolutely everything. So that also decreases the number of you know the need or the requirements for those chains. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean definitely there is tech enough in there to, to you know to cater to a lot of people. Um, maybe let's go in there, like, because it's interesting. Usually people are like, oh, Bitcoin will scale to everyone and stuff like that. But like, what are the people that will not adopt Bitcoin or like who, who will adopt Bitcoin? Like what's the differentiation here? I am um, the view I have on, on Bitcoin and, um, and on liquid. Uh, I mean, in, in fact, thanks to studying liquid and the use cases that it can enable, I changed my mind with regards to Bitcoin. You know, I used to be a person that, as many others, used to think that Bitcoin is going to be uh, hard money and um, used by everyone and needed to scale to, for everyone. But I changed my mind uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, probably. And, and the reason is that I think that what cypherpunks were trying to solve was basically enabling trust to scale, right? And, and that... And, and I think that probably Satoshi made a lot of work to trying to to, to enable uh, one of those rights, the, the ability to exchange with money, but but without proper stability, I, I I changed my mind and I now think that it will be hard to to be used as a general means of of exchange. So what I think now Bitcoin is is basically a digital private property without the need for laws, right? So, so basically what cypherpunks were trying to enable was um, our trust to scale by removing the needed parts that are in the, in the middle, right? To enable our cooperation. And, and what, what, are, what is needed in our cooperation uh, is um, institutions, right? Is, is basically rules and protocols that are in the, in the middle between you and I, for example, if we don't know each other, if you and I are strangers, in order to cooperate. And cypherpunks, by removing that, the need for those institutions, enable trust to scale in the, in the digital age, right? And, and I think that one of those institutions is private property. If, you're, if you cannot own things in, in the internet, uh, 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 you know, or, uh, and you can't exchange them, perhaps not at scale as if it were money, but you can still exchange them, then uh, it, it is hard uh, for, for trust to scale in the digital age if I want to make business with someone in, in Argentina or Mexico, Albania or whatever. And, and, and I'm more, I follow more the, the sub, what I call the Nick Sabo School of Economics rather than the School of Economics of many other uh, Bitcoiners out there, right? And, and that, that, this has changed my whole, um, let's say, uh, Bitcoin worldview. And, 
and, and but, but and that's why in part I think that not that many uh, I mean not everyone will need to adopt a uh, Bitcoin. With adopt Bitcoin, you mean with uh, putting it like as a medium of exchange and not the store of value aspect. Like adopting Bitcoin is not for you when when someone also just like holds it for a store of value uh, reasons, because it seems like you it's store of value um, is really good, but uh, you don't think it will be a medium of exchange. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a great store of value, but what I think uh, uh, Bitcoin is best for is basically. Uh, enable enabling private property whenever you cannot own property otherwise. And that happens in countries and in situations where a uh, rule of law doesn't work. You know, where, I mean, basically, if you think about it, what makes money good is actually how good is the debt in the asset side of the, of the central bank balance sheet, right? That is what makes... Uh, uh, the, the rule of law in the U.S., for example, is really good compared to many other countries. It's not great. It's, it's not the best. It's, it's not ideal, but better, way better than in many other countries as well. In, and it's in Switzerland. And if you have proper rule of law, that means that debts uh, are likely to get paid back. Right. And if debts get paid back, the, the balance sheet, the asset side of the balance sheet of a central bank is basically... Uh, mostly private and public debt. And, and, and if that public and private debt is likely to be paid, it means that asset uh, balance sheet is, is good, is valuable. And therefore, the, the liability part of it, which is the currency, is, is valuable as well. And that's why uh, countries with good rule of law enable good money, but also private property. You know, people can be sure that their private property is is something that they can count on, you know, by, you know, using the courts or wh whatever disputes are typically solved. And, uh, and with Bitcoin, we remove completely all that, you know, we remove completely all the need for all the legal, uh, uh, all the regulatory, all the enforcement infrastructure that is super expensive and that is needed in order to, to reach consensus on who owns what, you know, reaching consensus on who owns what is something that is, is so fascinating and, and but but so extremely expensive that even nowadays in in the 21st century most countries cannot afford it and they have wars you know they have guerrillas they have terrorism they have every single you know kind of thing and uh, because the rule of law is not there so in those situations and also in cyber cyberspace which is an a, a place where rule of law doesn't exist and it's impossible to implement where, where laws don't work. It's also an area where you need a, a technology to enable private property without the need for those laws. And that's where I think Bitcoin excels, basically. You know, and, 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 and so, so for me, even if many people in Switzerland uh, own um, uh, Bitcoin, in my view, probably Switzerland would be the country where people would need it the least, right? And, and so that, but that is the fundamental uh, use case, in my opinion. It doesn't mean that many people will not be jumping on this ship in order to speculate with a potential, uh, you know, increase in value, right? Uh, which is, you know, in, which is probably the most common use case at this point. Uh, I think that eventually more and more people will realize that it, it is good to own an insurance. If you if you look at the article and the, at the shelling out article from Nick Sabo, which is uh, uh, probably uh, one of the best ones from him, uh, you, you realize that what people used to use, uh, what our ancestors used as self-custodied wealth, they used this uh, as an insurance mostly, right? And And... What Bitcoin enables is just that, in case uh, things go crazy, which is also a use case that it's very likely nowadays. If you think about it, Internet is changing completely the trust in our institutions, in our existing institutions. You know, everything that we're seeing in the news nowadays is basically a com massive transfer shift, a, a massive shift of trust in the institutions, you know, in governments, in laws, in contracts, in in banks, in, in the police, in, you know, whatever institution you can think of, trust is basically shifting away from those and moving away to new ones. And it, it was very interesting to see, for example, Elon Musk's uh, tweet recently challenging the EU, you know, 
I found it fascinating because it's a, a new institution, which is Twitter, saying, hey, you cannot get in there, in here, right? You, you, you have to stop, you know, it, and I'm going to stop you. It, it's basically a sovereign individual stopping the EU, you know, from getting into, you know, from, from censoring uh, all our uh, tweets. So, yeah, it's an incredible part of uh, incredible changes we're living. And, and I think that those that work in Bitcoin and, and technologies such as Liquid are, you know, on the right side of history, basically. <laughs> Do you think then uh, when Bitcoin will not be used as a mean of exchange uh, from everyone, we need something else? Like, do you think that fiat currencies then will always be around? I think, I think so. But let me clarify something. When I say means of exchange, I don't mean money. Uh, and money for me is a generally, uh, a commonly accepted means of exchange. So it means that whatever you're going to be paying, it, it is very likely to be accepted, Right. And that's what I think Bitcoin is not going to be. But I think Bitcoin is a great means of exchange, right? It's going to be accepted as a means of exchange for, I don't know how wide, but a decent number of use cases. Uh, uh, you know, so you and I will be able to exchange uh, Bitcoin easily, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that I'm going to go to a store down there and it's going to be easily accepted. And, and it, chances are, you know, it's going to be accepted for sure, you know? Uh, other means of uh, exchange that keep stability will be, you know, um, uh, more uh, demanded by the market, I believe, right? And that's that's why Tether rocks, you know, it's it's basically killing it, right? And USDT is basically doing something that uh, Liquid enables, which is uh, connecting a reputed institutions like, like, like the central bank in, in the U.S., with users worldwide that wouldn't have... Basically, in my opinion, Tether is exporting rule of law, the, the US rule of law to users worldwide. You know, and it's, it's fascinating, you know? But so I think that I, I am very critical of the still very prevalent view uh, with Bitcoiners that... Um, well, I'm not very critical, I'm, I'm okay. But <laughs> what I mean is I don't agree with it any longer, you know, with a view that Bitcoin is going to be used uh, to be used absolutely everywhere. I think it's going to be used a lot uh, for, a, for a wide set of uh, use cases, but that is different than being a generally accepted or a common accepted means of exchange. That, that, that is an entirely different uh, story because the, the lack of stability is not something that some, anyone has figured out. Even, you know, it, If you think about it, even Nick Szabo gave up with Bitgold, right? He was trying to enable that kind of stability in the supply and, and he gave up, right? So, um, yeah, that's, that's my view, if that makes sense. <laughs> What do you mean with uh, stability in, in supply? Do you mean yeah. price volatility or...? Yeah, what I mean is, uh, uh, in order to be stable, it needs to be stable uh, with regards compared to um, a basket of goods, Right, uh, uh, the the price of a basket of goods, whatever size it is, but a, a basket of goods, and and if supply is uh, basically fixed, uh, then uh, and and demand is variable by default. The demand for money and liquidity is is very variable, so the the chances that demand is going to match uh, supply, at, you know, at continuous or very constant uh, time is very unlikely, in my opinion. I don't. I don't totally discard it, to be honest. I don't totally discard it. There might be folks out there, uh, uh, you know, way smarter than me that figure out uh, uh, ways in which you can enable some kind of supply mechanism that adapts to demand, you know, which is what a centralized entity like a central bank does. In, 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 well, no, there are many things they do, but one of them is this one. And it's, it's valuable. But, but I'm at this point way less i buy this idea less than i did a couple of years ago or and more i mean the volatility is interesting because for me it's like um right now it's highly volatile of course it's like a really young uh form of money like if if you look at the history of money like the those things you needed like hundreds sometimes like thousands of years to actually develop uh and so like bitcoin is like so young <laughs> and, and 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 like how many people actually have 50% plus of their net worth in Bitcoin. That, like that number has to be super low. Like a lot of people, like I guess like 100 million, maybe 200 million people have in some capacity Bitcoin. But if you have just like 2% of your net worth in Bitcoin, how much do you really have in, in, in Bitcoin? So, do I mean, be in so no, let me, let me clarify that 
this is partly this change in opinion is partly based in my experience. You know, I have kids, I have lots of expenses, and I realize the cost of volatility is huge. You, you know, I, I used to, before having kids and all these expenses, I used to think it's okay to have to be 50, 60 percent of my net worth in, in Bitcoin. Wow, it, I totally changed my mind, right? Because, you know, if you need, if your demand for liquidity happens when the price is in here, it's going to hurt. And, it, and I've been really through a lot of pain, right? And so that, that personal experience is mostly what made me change my mind a lot with this regard. Yeah, I mean, you know, like right now it's it's highly volatile. Like you you cannot really, like it's hard right now to use it as a hundred percent Bitcoin standard. Like if sure, you right. do that, uh, you live kind of you live in, uh, in in El Salvador and you're doing that. That 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 means that you have a stable income that you can rely on and that you can actually pay your bills even if it fluctuates like fifty percent. Totally. Um, so as I do it, like I have everything that I don't need for my monthly income. Yes in Bitcoin. Uh, and I rely on that, that income comes every month. And I also said a lot of the times, if I ha would have kids, if I would have employees, if I had with like other responsibilities that would totally change. Like if I, uh, like right now I have the situation where, uh, if all the Bitcoin goes to zero tomorrow, and at the same time, all my income goes to zero tomorrow, I still can live a few months. Yes. I cannot live like uh, with five people three months. <laughs> that, that's not exactly. possible because I'm so risky in there. Like I'm just 25. I can also still live with my parents and stuff like that. Like I have a personal situation. This is always important. Exactly. But the point that I was before getting to is like, what happens if like more crazy people like me <laughs> um, put like over 50% of their net worth in Bitcoin? Because then... I guess it gets way more stable and I'm talking like really long term. Like I'm not talking like 10, 20 years. I think it needs way longer. I think volatility is going to be a lot more crazy in the next years than even it was like the last years because like a lot of uh, forces come into play. But uh, what if the volatility against market goods is stable because so many people actually adopted this as a store of value. Could it then be also a meat of exchange? I've never, I've heard this argument uh, a few times, but I've never really understood it, to be honest. I've, I've never really understood why the fact that a lot of people own it, that, that would definitely create a very thick order book, right? And, and therefore, the, the movements, uh, uh, you know, when a match is created, should be shorter and smaller. Uh, that's for sure. But it wouldn't change the fact that if the demand of liquidity changes and, and it has changed for me, I have needed liquidity when the price was here. Uh, if the demand of liquidity changes for a number of folks at a particular number of, uh, you know, a, a point in time, then the demand of Bitcoin will change. And, and, and that would mean that, you know, the price will go here, but the supply will not move. Right. And that will create a, a spike in the price that will be very significant. I, I'm not able to get around this fact. You know, I, I'm not able to get around the fact that the supply is fixed um, any longer, even if many, many people own it. I, I haven't been able to understand why having a lot of people owning it, it should change this. Again, the order book idea, yes, I get it. But the demand in, in, in liquidity is very changing. You know, it changes a lot. And even, for example, in, a, in times of uh, a crisis, you know, when, when people start, uh, you know, paying attention to the, to the fact that the economy is, you know, shaking and all that, and they want, uh, you know, liquidity, uh, right? The, the liquidity will spike a lot, and therefore the price should go very high. And, and, and the change, the opposite should, should happen as well. When, when everything is stable, people would gradually demand less liquidity and go after assets that would yield some interesting uh, profitability over time and, or invest in businesses or whatever. Uh, that would change the demand as well. And it, the demand would, for liquidity would go downwards. And therefore, uh, since the price doesn't move, 
then you wouldn't have stability any longer. But again, I don't mean uh, <laughs> I am right or I am wrong. I just haven't been able to properly understand how the fact that so many people would hold it should change this dynamic. I, I don't get it. And I, and I haven't been able to find someone that really gives me an argument that I should uh, totally buy. I haven't. And, and therefore, I'm just a skeptical. I'm, I'm not either 100% either on one side or in the other. I'm just way more skeptical than I was. And also because of this personal experience that I told you. Uh, way more skeptical than I was uh, just a few years back. Yeah, I mean, if Bitcoin always stays volatile, it will never be a medium of exchange and unit of account in a big way. Like that's, I totally agree with like that. That's um, a, a no brainer for me. Like if, mm. if Bitcoin changes like 10, 20% in a month, it cannot be a unit of account long term. People will still transact in it. Uh, people will still use it, but it will not be a general accepted currency. Mm. I, I was like, um, my, my thought was always like, um, it is right now volatile but when you look at gold for example um it's way less volatile uh what if, what happens is like the like that's high prophetic and it takes a long time but if like we have this singularity of money coming to fruition where like at some point all the wealth is stored in in in, in kind of one vehicle and bitcoin actually sucks up like the financial energy of real estate and, and gold and all that things which um, I think, but it's a long way and a hard way and, and nothing maybe not happens in my lifetime, even though I'm very young. Um, but what if that happens, then there's like so much money in there so that it hardly moves. When we look at Bitcoin's history, man, we kind of already see that a little bit. 15 years is not a lot of history. Um, but when Elon Musk in 2021 came in, uh, it moved a lot. Like this was the richest man alive uh, back then, I think even now. And he said like, oh, yes, I want to buy uh, Bitcoin. I like it, accept it for Teslas and all that stuff. And I think price moved up like 30%, like something crazy. And then like a few weeks later, he's like, ah, I don't, I'm not sure about that environment thing, which was completely <laughs> in, uh, interesting uh, to see. Uh, and then the price actually moved back down to exactly where it was before him, which was also very interesting to see. But there you could see like the Bitcoin is a very small asset still. And one guy has a major impact on the price. Yeah. Even now, I feel like the, this impact is now less. Like even if like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk comes out and does something, the impact would be less, but I could be wrong. Maybe it depends on like when Apple now comes out and says like, oh, 50% of our balance sheet tomorrow will be converted to Bitcoin or was converted to Bitcoin like the last quarter, probably that's more realistic. That would massively influence the price. We are talking like, I think hundreds of percents of, uh, of, of gains uh, and also like volatility along the way. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking like uh, it, it could go to a, a, a size that might change that fact. But I agree with you, like, totally, like, as long as it stays volatile, there's no chance that it gets a medium of exchange. Well, there's no way around the fact that uh, uh, many people are in Bitcoin simply speculating, right? And, and we should be frank about this fact. Uh, I, am, I am in love with the cypherpunk uh, vision of enabling trust to scale by removing these trust intermediaries, right? And and this is what I'm loving with, with with regards to Bitcoin and what I'm in love with with regards to, to Liquid. But it doesn't change the fact that many people are simply here because when the price goes up, they want to be in the wagon, right? And, 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 and that people change their mind with regards to an asset if Elon Musk uh, gives them their, their, his endorsement or Jeff Bezos or any of those folks. Uh, it doesn't change mine one bit. It, you know, my, my view with regards to Bitcoin. Uh, if Elon Musk, I, don't, I couldn't care less. I have a clear vision on what uh, Bitcoin is uh, uh, for me and how it changes the world. And, and I want to be in that wagon for those reasons. So, um, in, in fact, you could argue that the, the fact that they move so fast it is actually the consequence of so many people playing with a casino on Bitcoin. But it, who, who cares? It's part of any new asset. Any new asset has 
speculation, people looking forward. Speculare, right? Speculare means looking forward. So, someone says this, said this in, Bitcoin, in Spanish Bitcoin. And I love the, the sentence because it means you are looking into the future, speculare. And, 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 and folks that think that they are on the right side are making bets and, and you know, hoping that it will increase in price. That's okay. Uh, uh, those that are right will be gaining money and those that fail will lo lose it. But those of us that are in here because they see value at owning Bitcoin, they, I, I find it valuable to own Bitcoin, right? Because it... It, it, it enables exchanges for me that are not possible otherwise. It enables exchanges. When, when I'm talking about exchanges, I mean both person to person, me to you, but also uh, with me and myself in the future, right? And, and, and therefore, I'm, I'm way super happy to own uh, Bitcoin, and I think that's where the value is. Uh, and and um, uh, the fact that I think it is not generally accepted means of exchange or the fact that there are many people uh, using it as a casino doesn't change that fact one bit, right? So, yeah. How, how will Bitcoin change the world? Yeah, it will change the world because, again, it will enable exchanges that are not possible otherwise. And this is what I see with Liquid. Uh, uh, and I find it uh, fascinating. Uh, with Liquid, if you think about it, or let, let me... Let me, let me try to explain to you what I find awesome about Liquid. And, and because it's this, exactly the same idea that I described about Bitcoin. If I step back, I, I would say, yeah, Bitcoin enables private property. It enables us to, to own something w without the need for any laws, which is an institution. It removes the need for that institution. And therefore, I can own property here where I live. I can own property in your country, in any other country in the world. And, and nobody can... Uh, you know, prevent that from, from, from happening. Prevent that from happening. So, uh, so what happens is that there are many other exchanges, there are many other many institutions that we can get rid of and let trust scale. And one of, the, of those institutions is financial markets. Markets are also a, an institution because it's, again, a number of rules and protocols that enables strangers to, to interact with each other. And, and financial markets are a very powerful one. In fact, it is extremely powerful because you, you could argue that in many emerging countries, the lack of these institutions, such, such as financial markets with proper rule of law, is what is preventing many of the very valuable assets that those countries have to connect with global liquidity. And by being unable to connect with global liquidity, there is no money flowing in and they cannot bootstrap, let's say, their, their economies, right? So, so what, what I think Liquid can enable is to uh, uh, make countries in emerging uh, economies with very lean regulatory bodies to, to enforce the right of an asset. If, for example, I own land in, in an emerging country and, and I want uh, to develop a real estate project. And if, if with very little laws, you know, with very, the need for very little laws and a very lean regulatory body that does think correct, you can then uh, connect the asset in a digital uh, form. You know, they, they, they would be an oracle. It, it, it's a trusted intermediary, but it would be way less than it, what it's needed currently in Europe or the U.S., to enable financial markets. You know, in order to, to enable financial markets in the EU or the US, you need a massive regulatory body, you need a national stock exchange, you need a clearinghouse, a, a central security depository, a settlement system that includes the central bank, and a, a huge number of regulatory bodies, supervision, auditing, uh, lawyers, any, anything, a, a huge number of, of things. And that system is extremely costly. And it's so costly that it's making all those emerging countries not being able to enable financial markets, advanced financial markets. So a, a system like Liquid that is secure because it uses Bitcoin's code base, UTXO model, and a number of other things, can enable a very lean regulatory body in an emerging country to connect the local assets with global liquidity, you know, with global investors. And therefore, let money get in and bootstrap truly economies. And, and we've seen this on liquid with a number of assets. And it's fascinating because 
Uh, lenders, for example, in Mexico, uh, uh, you know, non-banking financial institutions that are, that are lending to individuals and SMEs in, in, in Mexico, uh, were not able uh, uh, to lend any longer despite having owning a lot of collateral, you know, or what, what is called promissory notes. And, and all of a sudden, thanks to Liquid, uh, these, these assets can move can be moved and used as collateral via token, by being a token. And this completely blew my mind because all of a sudden these non-banking financial institutions can lend way more, way more into the Mexican economy. So, so we're, and, and it's thanks that to, to U.S. banks and U.S. funds lending money through liquid onto these non-banking financial institutions. So we are basically collecting very valuable assets thanks to a law in Mexico that makes them very... Uh, strong from the legal standpoint with global liquidity, you know, and uh, it, it really blows my mind. So, and it even made me change the focus of my work. You know, I, I, I was, you know, chasing traditional financial institutions in Europe and, and, and the US, but I realized that were, what a truly secure blockchain for financial markets, where it really solves a problem is in emerging economies, right? So it, that is, the, to respond to your question, if you want to buy the assets in the, in, in liquid, you will need liquid, you will need Bitcoin, you know. So it will enable exchanges that are not possible otherwise. Uh, it is already enabling exchanges that are not possible otherwise, you know. And it's enabling um, many other use cases that we are seeing coming, you know, where uh, the need uh, for trust the laws are what makes you you know, choose where, where to put your trust. You know, if, if, a, if there is a law, it will tell you, you can trust this institution because it's supervised, it's regulated, you know, blah, 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 all that, you know. But if there is no law, you don't know who to trust. So in order to reach consensus, that's where a blockchain, a secure blockchain really solves a problem. And that is needed in these kind of countries, you know, where there, there is no such laws, you know. And, and this is what is blowing my mind because it exactly matches the, the, what I think Bitcoin is solving, you know? And uh, uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's about, uh, I didn't use Liquid before uh, joining uh, Blockstream, but as I understood it, I'm, I'm a hardcore user right now, you know? And so I'm using already Bitcoin as an exchange, a means of exchange for assets that are not possible otherwise. This is, this is what I mean by that. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistic. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order, plus you support my channel. And and now let's get back to the video. Mm, that's interesting. Um, maybe for those who, who don't know much about Liquid, how does it work? What exactly is it? And let's make it uh, uh, for, for them understandable. Sure. Liquid is a side chain of, of Bitcoin, right? And uh, basically what um, it means, this means is that if uh, a blockchain by, by definition uh, does, shouldn't try to achieve uh, security, decentralization, and scalability on the same chain, uh, because that uh, uh, could and in fact uh, does uh, compromise the security of the native token. And if you are, if you think that the security of that native token is uh, very important, as we all think with regards to Bitcoin, uh, then it's it would be a bad idea to enable that scalability and fancy functionalities for financial markets on top of the same uh, blockchain where where the native token is, is, is stored. And therefore, that's why um, uh, the founders at Blockstream decided that the best way forward would be to, to enable that kind of uh, fancy features and scalability on a second layer. The way it works is that you lock Bitcoins on a, 
uh, uh, address uh, controlled by a number of companies, which are the members of the federation uh, that, that manages the liquid network. And then it gets unlocked on the liquid network with different protocol rules. And different pro by pr different protocol rules, I mean faster, cheaper, you know, and with all these opcodes, with uh, the, the ability to program a very interesting logic to the transactions, you know, that is not possible on Bitcoin main chain, but securely, unlike on other blockchains. And, and uh, liquid is, again, managed by currently around 80 companies, 80 companies that are organized in a federation, and this federation has three boards, and they vote in those uh, boards whenever they want to propose, uh, you know, the uh, new member joining, um, new rules, or to change the technology roadmap of, of Liquid, you know, and they vote there and they make these decisions. Interestingly, this consensus model uh, has, of course, uh, the disadvantage over Bitcoin that it's not entirely decentralized. But on the other hand, uh, uh, it is a proven model because it's exactly the way the, the, the consensus model that manages national stock exchanges, clearing houses, depositaries, and even central banks. Central banks are actually, in fact, many of them at least, are federation of members, federations of members, you know, and those members are the ones that take the decisions. Uh, with regards to the central bank. Uh, yeah, that's the, the way it works. And, and the, the, the goal of Liquid is basically enabling these advanced financial applications that are not possible otherwise. You know, by removing all those trusted intermediaries, intermediaries that I... Uh, if you think about it, all those trusted intermediaries are nothing more than uh, record-keeping companies. You know, they keep a ledger, basically, you know, with lots of controls, lots of supervision, lots of... But we can turn all those ledgers into just one. You know, and, and all those federations into just one. And that's what Liquid does. You know, Liquid enables just that. And what we are seeing right now is to, I would frame it as two categories mainly. One is scalability use cases, which is, you know, using Bitcoin uh, to pay or, or to buy things uh, faster and cheaper or to balance payment channels, for example, or, to, you know, many other use cases that are, are part of the scalability category that I would call. And there are other use cases which are capital markets. You know, and most of my focus is capital markets. And, and it's basically enabled, you know, that those interesting assets in any country to be connected to global investors, right? And that's where I think Liquid excels. And, and precisely, if I may add, the key differentiating factor of Liquid over other, over other blockchains is that if you, if you want to need lost the least, you need to have, you know, security paranoid approach to software development, you know, and that's what we have in, in Bitcoin, right? And that's what Liquid inherits by, by using its code base. So, so yeah, it, it, it is funny because I typically travel to these places in Tratva in Europe or the US, and then they say, you know, technology is a commodity. Technology, the blockchain that is going to be used in financial markets is a commodity. And they couldn't be more wrong, in my opinion. And the reason why they're wrong, in my opinion, is because it, they are used to regulating absolutely everything. The, the EU has the power to regulate anything, right? They have all the lawyers they need, all the regulators, all the supervision that is needed, could be needed to regulate anything. And if you can regulate any, anything, you don't need security. Because whenever a, a smart contract is going to break, there will be someone to regulate what happens when things break. But instead, in an emerging country, if they don't have the legal enforcement and apparatus to, to regulate what happens when things break, that's when, when they choose a security paranoid blockchains, you know, and, and that's where the value is, in my opinion. And that's also why in Bitcoin, the security is totally paranoid. You know, the, if, you don't, if you want to totally remove the need for any trusted intermediaries, then uh, uh, security has been completely crazy. And that's what, in my opinion, Nick Sab always means when he says trusted intermediaries are, uh, trusted third parties are security holes, right? It's really interesting. And, and I feel like when, when we talk about uh, sidechains, uh, second layers, and uh, all, all those scaling solutions to Bitcoin, um, most people usually think about Lightning first, like they, they have like the Lightning apps and, and Lightning is a really big name uh, in the space. How does it, um, how is it different to light? How is liquid different use cases? Uh, are they complementary to each other? Like how does this work? 
Yeah, Lightning is great for the means of exchange use case for, for the usual one, for payments, you know, for, but, but that's Lightning with regards to Bitcoin. But I see Lightning nowadays as, as simply, a, a, not simply, but a, a great technology for any UTXO-based model, uh, uh, model uh, asset. And, and that is Bitcoin, but it's also an illiquid asset. You know, so for me right now, even if, you know, we have a service that is green light that enables Lightning Network as a service. So if anyone doesn't want uh, to, to run a Lightning Network node, they, they would hire us and they, they can enable that non-custodially, you know, which is great. And that, serving, that service is growing with regards to Bitcoin. But, but now for me, it's even more interesting to enable Lightning on Liquid for any asset that requires maximum throughput. You know, so for example, uh, we have a number of uh, stable coins. Uh, there is particularly one. I cannot talk about it yet, unfortunately, but uh, there is one that is, uh, uh, I think it's going to grow a lot, you know, over the next few months. And, and I expect, uh, hopefully, to be a problem, to become a problem in terms of throughput on Liquid. And that, at some point, uh, will force us to implement a Lightning Network for that uh, particular asset. And hopefully, <laughs> I, I like that kind of problems, right? And, and, <laughs> and for any uh, other asset that grows enough to make the space in the blocks uh, too expensive, right? And th that's what uh, Lightning is. It's a great scalability solution for any uh, situation where a, a throughput is a problem. Uh, and, and Liquid is just... A, a, Liquid, you could argue that it is partially great for throughput, but where it is actually great, in my opinion, is to enable different means of exchange use cases, not only payments, but also uh, buying these assets that can yield a, a profit, that can make you enable you to own assets in companies, in, in debt, in land, in whatever you know, asset that can be, uh, let's say, tokenized. Interesting. Uh, it's, it's like this... The this topic there are so many factors already in like it's it's uh even for someone like me like there's kind of evolved in all all the things like it it kind of gets <laughs> it's kind of chaotic um then there's two other things uh that also come up sometimes on my podcast this is fediment and arc how how different are those like fediment like the federation system it sounds a little bit like liquid uh when you talk about it how th does th those compare to be honest i don't know much about uh fediment i haven't been uh, looking at it but but simply because since i uh, most of my work is with regards to capital markets uh, in regards to capital markets uh Fediment is is not there. What what capital markets are currently looking at is mostly other blockchains, you know, and and that's where I think we have a, a huge market and a massive. Uh, uh, that is where we can grow the most. So I haven't been paying attention to Fediment. I have to be entirely honest. With regards to Arc, I think it's in very early stages, but it's very promising, you know, and I think. In, it is Marco um, from Bolpem that is looking at it, and I like Marco a lot, you know. And if he's putting his eyes into this, I think it's it, it has great chances of being great, and I certainly hope so. But again, I I haven't deep dived that much in, into Arc either. I think it's still early stages. It, it is promising simply because of the people that are, are on top of it. Again, not because I think I have a strong opinion, but it's great. And I hope that experimentation keeps happening and that we keep uh, finding uh, uh, the proper trade-offs for each uh, use case. Uh, you know, I think that in blockchains, it's all about trade-offs. And this is, it, it is not about finding, for, because for example, uh, some people ask me, yeah, you think that security is, is paramount to enable financial markets and all that, but uh, Tether runs mostly on Tron, you know? And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, but security on Tron sucks. But, but for a payment of, you know, of uh, $20 or $100, you know, security is not really a big issue, right? I'm talking about really massive amounts of, of value, you know, assets that are worth billions or, or, or trillions, you know, in, in liquid, the total value lock right now is 1.7 billion already, you know, and many people in the Bitcoin space are not even aware of this, you know, and we have many kinds of assets already and it's valuable assets that are being used as, as collateral. And, and 
uh, uh, stable coins are way more than this, but scattered across many different blockchains, you know? So every blockchain has a different uh, trade-off and depending on the use case you need to enable, you will need one trade-off or, or the other, right? And, and that's where I think we will find use cases for ARC. Hopefully uh, we will find use cases for Fedimint and others. And I think that we, keep, we need to keep exploring where each uh, blockchain act does actually solve a problem. Yeah, and I think this is the, the, the main takeaway always for me. Like we have to keep innovating. We have to keep uh, uh, trying to find new ways to do things uh, because we are so early in that space with Bitcoin uh, and uh, nobody 100% knows what the future looks like and how we, we will do it in like 20, 50, 100 years. But it's always fun to, to speculate about that and always fun to talk about that. Uh, and my main takeaway is always like, let's let's keep... <laughs> researching let's keep innovating also like uh mark on uh, uh, something like that uh he's also on the um, uh, already was on the podcast so if you just like oh, type okay. in my channel marco you you will you'll find it in my library for everyone watching and listening um we have before we start in the end routine uh one question that is always getting uh, like or all my guests are getting um it aims for getting something else outside of of bitcoin and outside of the things that we already talked in the podcast in the podcast um what can we learn from you besides bitcoin liquid and all the things that we uh, talked about for, for me personally yeah whatever you want to talk about outside of that realm okay uh, yeah you i i managed a weather company for six years uh, so and most of our services were with regards to energy markets uh, because it's it's critical. You know, the weather for, you know, wind power and solar power and how it impacts the price, at, you know, the wholesale price in the markets. So, uh, and that's also the reason why I, I very quickly and very early saw the, the synergies between uh, Bitcoin mining and the energy markets. So with regards to energy markets and weather, uh, I think I can hopefully uh, be helpful for whoever wants to know a little bit more about that. That's interesting. Like a, a weather company. What, what is a weather company doing? I never heard that. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Weather companies, I mean, weather affects any, any outdoor activity, right? So we work with energy markets the most because it's where most money is, but also with ship transportation, uh, road transportation, airports, insurance companies, agriculture, you name it. And, and what basically you, you do is you use weather models, uh, numerical models, and uh, try to find correlations with uh, business variables, right? And in, in this case that I mentioned, it would be power production for wind power, for solar power, uh, and all these things. Uh, but with regards to, to agriculture, it would be, for example, things with regards to the soil, the humidity of the soil, the, the variables, the, the temperature in the soil, the temperature, uh, you know, at centers, certain sensors with center sensors and many other things. And that kind of mixture of different variables, when you uh, mix it with the production or, for example, with the ability to, I remember a very funny use case, which, which was, for example, a retail company in Canada uh, they always run out of stock of barbecue stuff, you know, like sausages and all these things, whenever the sun came out and decent temperatures, you know, and they wanted to be able to, to keep in stock enough so that they could sell it all, you know, when, when the time comes, you know, when the weather is appropriate. And therefore, um, they wanted our service to, to be able to provide decision support systems. What we provided, the, the, the deliverable for customers were, was a decision support system. So basically the person making a decision with regards to the price of energy, the, the insurance, the price of an insurance or the, the operations behind the back end, the back office for a, a insurance management and these kind of things. All these, peoples, these people that are making decisions need a, an easy support system that tells them, hey, do this within this uh, time window. Don't do this with here use this price here, you know, so basically all kinds of web-based or mobile-based uh, fancy tools that enabled made them to make uh, good decisions. There were, or even, for example, gas traders, I mean, 
there's a myriad of people using weather information. You wouldn't believe it. But it's a tiny sector. So it's a very small industry. So not that many, many people uh, know it. Oh, that's that's really interesting. Uh, uh, that's that's almost worth a, a full podcast. <laughs> <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> so many questions around that, but we, we have to come to the end routine. <laughs> <laughs> totally. uh, um, our end routine is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest uh, actually is. And uh, the question for you is, what could the future of humanity look like when we have access to limitless power on a Bitcoin standard? Well, what would be uh, what would humanity look like if there is limitless power? But is it is the idea if we get, for example, fusion, fusion power, and and uh, how we would? I, I don't see the relationship between uh, the Bitcoin standard and the having fusion, other than it would we would have very cheap power prices, but the infrastructure would still need to be paid for, right? So it's very expensive to build a, a nuclear fusion reactor. So Oh, it is in, it's not even possible yet, but uh, but um, if we would get it, uh, well, uh, look, I'm a optimistic. I'm a rational optimistic. So what I believe is that we humans uh, solve problems. We are great at solving problems. We are we are able to create explanatory knowledge, as my favorite author David Deutsch always says, and that means that uh, whatever is a problem with regards to uh, anything, we will figure it out. Uh, we will figure it out. We only need to have good ideas. And that's why I'm a great defendant of the West, the ideas of the West, you know, of the Western countries. And I think they are under threat right now, you know, and I'm, and what I think that whatever the problem is, you know, uh, expensive energy or cheap energy, I think that what it's important is that we prevail, uh, we keep um, the uh, error correction mechanisms and and in the west what what i think that has made us progress in the, within the last 300 years is the tradition of criticism you know we are able to criticize we should be able to criticize and have free speech for that you know and and any kind of problem that one or any other can be solved if we keep that in mind okay so let's keep western values in place and let's protect them and let's uh, keep any threat away from here because it's been good so far and let's uh, keep progress happening. That's what I would say. <laughs> Absolutely. Freedom of speech is so important. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very important. Uh, before I let you go, uh, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you and have questions? I'm not uh, very active lately. I was very active before on, on Twitter, but I'm not any longer. So you can find me on LinkedIn, but also on the Vault 2 community that Blockstream enabled for uh, both um, Cord Lightning and, and Liquid. Uh, so yeah, both places. Perfect then. Yeah, thank you for joining us today and also for everyone watching and listening. Thank you for joining us today. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.